Hello, people. So here we are, uh, yet another stage of proof rock. And in this case, uh, we've managed to move him along the, the poem, and we are in the interlude section of the piece, starting with line 70. So as a quick rundown, we've learned, basically, he's a very nervous individual. He can't see the full woman, and he also has a negative view about himself. As a result, he's isolated from society. He's very negative and bitter and pessimistic and um, lonely. And he has this obsession along with women. He has an obsession with time. And um, we'll be discussing more of the time element today. Uh, so, what we have here, uh, like I just mentioned, is the interlude. Uh, so, the poem is divided up into three parts. This is part two. It's the shortest section of the whole poem. It's only two stanzas, and these stanzas equal five lines. It easily could have been presented as one stanza. But, as I want to read it, do note the dramatic pause in the middle. And we'll talk about that pause in itself. Okay, um, so line 70. Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Where this is picking up, it is continuing the themes of loneliness. It's continuing the themes of isolation and separation from one's own society. In this particular case, he opens up with shall, I say. And this is a conditional. It another way of putting it is another way of putting it would be, um, could I say? He's questioning the worth of mentioning the commentary. And in this case, what I want to stress is he has yet to say in the past stanzas that he has himself experienced being with the prostitutes. He only hints at the prostitutes. He knows of their existence. He knows of their function in society, but he doesn't exactly say he has participated with the prostitutes. Furthermore, if you go back and look at the stanzas themselves, where I was mentioning how he talks through coded language about them, he never will say the word prostitute. He does not acknowledge the, their existence. He only talks about them in symbol, in metaphor. So on a flip side, in this interlude, he's actually showing himself walking through the streets of London. And the, the term narrow streets is letting you know this is, again, the inner city. And he's looking at men, lonely men, in their shirt sleeves. So because they're in their shirt sleeves, this means they are working class. Because they're leaning out of their windows, um, you get the sense of a tenement dwelling. And these men are just merely socializing amongst themselves, talking, conversing as they smoke their pipes. Do notice proof rock is down out on the streets. The men are up on the in the uh, stair uh, stairs. They're up in the, um, the the floors of the tenement. They they are above proof rock. Proof rock is looking up at them, and this is mirroring the image of the women who are above looking down on proof rock as he's descending the stairs with the bald spot. Uh, so again, he's showing himself 
separated from any type of collective group of society. In particular, these working men, and remember this is the early 1900s, roughly 1917. This is before the telephone, this is before the TV, before radio, before cinema, you had theater, you had cabaret, um, and if you wanted to spend your money, you could go to the pub. But for the most part, if you're working class, you really want to be saving your money and you can't afford to go out a lot. Uh, so your only social interaction is to lean out your window and see if your neighbor's in and talk to him. Just general gossip between neighbors. Now, Prufrock is looking up at them with a sense of longing. The, um, this can be taken two ways. A lot in this work can be taken two different ways. In this case, the first way to read it, um, Prufrock is looking at the men because they have a group sense of brotherhood. They have a community to themselves and they're interacting within that community. And he's, um, sad that he doesn't have that sort of connection. They being lower class or working class, um, have a connection that he does not have as a uh, upper class gentleman. There's no one for him to relate to. That's one way. Uh, the second way to read it is that he is indeed looking for a more than friendly connection from the men. And it's a desire, a sexual desire. But, and this is the important thing. You remember way back in the first stanza, let me skim all the way back up there. In the first stanza, he mentions the overwhelming question. Okay. It's line 10. The, um, the streets, again, streets that follow that leads you to an overwhelming question. And then you have these ellipses. Notice here, he's talking about another set of streets, narrow, inner city, uh, dark, it's evening. And again, they, these streets lead him to lonely men like himself. And you got the ellipses. It's almost as if he's pausing and on the verge of admitting that he is looking at them with more than just a, a jealousy or loneliness. Uh, uh, this is something more intense. Again, you can read this many ways. Those are just two of the possibilities. Uh, you have this pause. And then he says the most miserable statement that he should have been an insect. He should not have been born human. At this moment, he feels totally dehumanized. He can't even see himself as a full crab or lobster that he's talking about here. He can only be the claws of the creature that is... Uh, um, out of human eyesight somewhere at the very depths of the ocean where the fish look very abstract on themselves, warped, uh, nightmarish creatures. And that's it. That's a short second moment. The brevity of it, the lack of information in it, uh, carries a lot of emphasis. So I, even if I'm not using a queer study lens, this one moment in the poem gives you a lot of push towards the inclination that he's repressing that aspect in his personality. Okay. This in itself could be the first possible solution to the unanswerable question or the um, overwhelming question that he never states. 
he's afraid to admit that his failures with women mean he should be looking towards men. And in 1917 in England, homosexuality was a major crime. You could be imprisoned for it. Uh, in some cases you were chemically castrated. So there's a lot of ramifications on a negative side uh, that would repress any possible leanings on his own self. So that could be why he's repressing the question. And he'll never ask that question. So we'll never know for certain what is the question. But that's one plausible solution. Okay, uh, the poem picks up and moves forward. We're now in part three. And it's as if that little interlude wasn't even discussed. He's going to go instantly back to elements of time. And the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or malingers, stretched on the floor here besides you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. The first thing to pick up on, time is presented here no longer as a feral animal, but as a pet, and again, a pet cat. In this case, the cat is stretched on the floor. Uh, so, at this moment, the you is addressing, excuse me, is addressing a human image in his mind. Or you can say it's an actual woman that he knows in his, in his fantasies. So the you is no longer himself alone. It is a social event that has happened in his past or one that he's dreaming uh, and hoping would happen in the future. But either way, the date is going horribly wrong. Time is stretched on the floor. Okay, it's, it's almost like it's between the two characters. It, it, when you say time is stretched, that means it's heavy, it's um, evident, and the, you, you, you can hear the clocks ticking in the awkward silence of the room. Nobody's talking. Nobody's paying attention to him. It's a dull event. He can't be entertaining on a date, and that's one of his fears. The other fear that he mentions, uh, forcing the moment to its crisis, this plays into that line about possibilities and um, probability. Now, this is before the interlude, and he, the, the best one, in fact, is the last time he mentioned it. And should I then presume, and how should I begin? This little statement is picked up again after the interlude in part three with this crisis. That is his crisis, that presumption. He wants to know how do you flirt with and seduce a woman of class? What this is paralleled with, he knows how to seduce, um, let me rephrase that, how to be with a prostitute. You just show the money to the right person and you're escorted into the room with the prostitute. In this case, with a woman of class, that would be totally vulgar and you'd be totally outcast and um, you become a major pariah of society. He knows that some men have experienced successful seductions of a woman during tea time, and he wants that. 
do notice he doesn't want to be married. He doesn't want a, a, a steady date. He just wants to be able to have sex with an upper class woman as a means of proving his importance to society, his significance for society. And it's failing miserably. He can't do this. He doesn't know how to read what a woman wants when a woman wants to be seduced. Okay. He fears rejection, basically, is what it comes down to. In line 82, he's going to... Eliot brings up in Prufrock's voice a biblical allusion. This is St. John the Baptist. And promptly after presenting the moment when St. John the Baptist was killed and his head was put on a platter and presented to the royal court of Herod, um, promptly right after that little image, Prufrock announces he's no prophet. And he is not a prophet on many different levels. His lack of morality, his lack of wanting to change society, um, his want of, or um, his lack of ingenuity of coming up with an idea to change his situation. He cannot predict what's going to happen to him in the next few months. And that's, again, another one of his fears. He does not want to die old and lonely. He fears turning middle-aged middle age and not having had a successful connection with a woman. It's not marriage that he's seeking. It's not courtship that he's seeking, which again, showing a major flaw in his character. Now, the eternal footman that's mentioned in line 85, that has dual purpose. The eternal footman can either be fate or death, or both for that matter. Uh, these personifications of abstract concepts are in disguise, as it were, as a servant. And it's a common uh, element in literature <clears throat> to have a divine or mystical concept insert into the plot of a story. So in this case, um, Prufrock's envisioning fate or death, as it were, um, as a servant, as an, uh, the um, butler-like role, and handing, uh, holding out the coat for Prufrock to wear. And the servant is snickering at Prufrock. Now, this fear that he mentions here is not the fact that death or fate are going to claim Prufrock at that moment and end his life. The fear is that these entities are snickering at him because they know he's the perfect joke. They are going to let him live a long life. He's going to have a miserable life all alone. So, we got a little contradiction going here. First, he says he is no prophet. He can't predict the future. But he is very much consciously aware of where he's, the direction that he probably will end up. A lonely old man. Again, that's his greatest fear, aside from rejection. Moving forward. Next stanza. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cup, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come back from the dead, come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all, if one settling a pedal, pillow by your head should say, that is not what I meant at all. 
that is not it at all. Let me go directly to the middle. Again, he's brought up the overwhelming question. It's going to be popping it in to the text on a irregular pattern, but it's, a, it's always a present. Its presence is always poking at him because he refuses to acknowledge it, basically. Uh, so the word it here is referring, again, to his hesitancies and his presumptions that we've talked about. Uh, again, you have you and me. This is the second time. This is where he's considering his dream date. It, it, the, the, a point to be considered, I always put it in these terms, this female you that he is considering obtaining a date or remembering a date of being with, this figure is in his head. So he is recreating the scenes or reimagining the scenes in his own head. So therefore, even though he's talking to the woman, he's really talking to himself because the scene is in his head. It's not in reality right in front of him. Okay. So even if it's a memory of an actual woman that he unfortunately had a horrible date with, he's remembering it in his own mind. He's recasting the scene in his head. So the you is indirectly a, based on a real woman, but directly it's himself. Or you could spin that the other way if you prefer. But either way you look at it, the you is just as much himself as before. So it's just an interesting way of looking at the situation. Now, Lazarus, as you know, is a biblical character. Uh, he is part of the miracles of Jesus. He was raised from the dead. And with that notion, it ties in with the whole point of Prufrock wanting to be raised taken out of this hell of his life and brought into a greater acknowledgement of awareness, a, a better reality, if he could, a, a better universe, if we go that far. As I say over here, there actually is a second instance in the New Testament where there's another character named Lazarus. Uh, there's a parable of a rich man and a poor man, and the poor man is named Lazarus. There is no connection between Lazarus of the miracle and Lazarus of the parable. The, in actuality, the parable is probably closer to what Eliot had in mind when he constructed this idea, because uh, you have a rich man and a poor man who basically die at the same night. The poor man is homeless, living in the alleyway outside of the rich man's house. And in this house, the rich man is spending and wasting all his money on women, wine, and um, orgies, you know, celebrating everything and not backing up the church or the temple, as it were. Uh, so when they die, the rich man goes straight to hell. The poor man goes into heaven. And the rich man asks the prophets in heaven if they could send Lazarus back, the poor man, send him back as a warning to his brothers. <clears throat> and of course, the main message that comes out of this, that's not how faith works. You have faith while you're alive. You take good actions while you're alive so that the consequences that occur are favorable to you. Otherwise, you're not justifying your own punishment. Um, the warnings are there in the holy writings. And if you're going to ignore them, then there's no other need for an announcement of how, what, uh, I'm sorry, announcement of the consequences of the afterlife. Okay. Also, what's here? Notice if one, that is a connection to the you. This is a female. She's put in a pillow by, 
behind your head. This is after tea time. After a, a stretch of time has occurred. And she's saying, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. So presumably what's happened, she put the pillow behind her head and Prufrock is thinking, oh, this is a sign. She's signaling to me that it's okay to try to seduce her. And he leans forward to try to sneak in a kiss. And she slaps his face and basically says this line, that's not what I meant. How dare you? Um, that is a part of his greatest fear. It, it all ties together. Rejection is what it comes down to. Okay. That scene is going to repeat down here at the bottom of this stanza in lines 109 and 110. <clears throat> So this stanza actually repeats a lot of the imagery of the previous stanza. And it's reasserting the same themes that were already mentioned. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. Um, okay. Again, there's a lot of echoing here of the previous stanza. Uh, what I have in blue is where we've got some slight differences. He brings up again women's clothing, particularly how women's clothing, when, and this is during the time when the, the dresses were really long, um, they have yet to start coming above the ankles, and that'll happen just after 1917. Uh, and when you have a long skirt like that that's trailing on the floor, it's going to gather up dust, it's going to get dirt, it will get muddy. If you're not careful, It'll get um, all the undesirable um, grit that's on the floor. Prufrock is viewing himself as the grit. That's what it comes down to. Here, this is where I lose most of my sympathy. This is where I start getting extremely irritated with him. Aside from repeating everything over and over again, here he openly admits in a moment of real of truth in reality he says it's impossible to say just what i mean here is a man who's talking specifically to himself in his head and when you're talking in your head you know what you mean you don't have to break down your commentary into elaborate um, rhetoric like you do when you're writing an argument paper you say what you mean, you know what the symbolism means, and you go on with your life. But here, it's it's at a moment, Prufrock is just throwing his hands up in the air and saying, no, I, I don't get it. I don't know what I'm trying to say. So after all this ranting, he reaches this impossible moment. So I get frustrated with him right there. Uh, and like I said before, these last four lines are repeating the scene from above and you've got if one a woman and it, it, he takes it a step further uh, more than just settling a pillow behind your head if she puts a pillow behind your head and throws off a shawl show a little shoulder so to speak um and then he tries to seduce her she would be horrified okay that is not what i meant at all how dare you as i said before Okay, now we're at the most important passage. There are only two pages left in the document, counting this one. 
He opens up here with, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an intended lord, one that will do to swell the progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Now, the mention of Prince Hamlet is a major moment here. You may remember, even if you haven't seen the play, you've heard the line, the, the, the famous line that Hamlet utters, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. Notice the phrasing, to be or not to be, that is the question. So there's your second instance of what the question possibly is, to be or not to be. And when you break down the significance of that line, when Hamlet utters it, it's the middle of the play, he has to make a choice, do I try to, to get revenge for my father's murder by killing my uncle who's married to my mother, or do I just give up? Do I just commit suicide? In other words, not to be. It's all about existence or suicide. <clears throat> and of course, knowing the play, that's the middle of the play, Hamlet decides, yes, I'll go seek revenge for my father, and you promptly get more action and ultimate tragedy at the end. In Prufrock's case, he doesn't want to acknowledge this question because he's afraid of the answer. Again, just like I said before, with the male gender um, choices. In this case, he's afraid if he asked to be or not to be, the answer is actually going to be not to be. And then he has the responsibility of having to kill himself. And that's a very depressing state of mind to be in, to be so utterly worthless that suicide isn't even an answer. Um, and again, this is where I've lost patience. I, I, he needs serious counseling. It's a very realistic, in a matter of speaking, it's a very realistic portrayal of somebody who is at a major point of hitting the bottom. Um, another thing of, of um, interest, he mentions the fool. In Hamlet's play, the fool is actually dead. So when he's, he's saying almost at times, I am the fool, he's basically saying my life is might as well be over. It, it, it seems as if I am dead. No one, uh, I'm a ghost wandering the streets. No one knows me. No one talks to me. No one wants to be near me. Oh, woe is me. Oh, woe is me. Okay, so that's where the connection is, how he's sometimes the fool. And, and especially line 120, I've reached my major point. He's whining about getting to middle age, as I said. Uh, he's only in his middle 30s, if that. And he's worried about being in his 50s. He's got 20 years where he could shape up, find someone, settle down, get married, have a family, make something worthwhile of his life. But all he does is sit in his chair and look at the fire. He's paralyzed. He can't move. He can't do anything. And here we come to the last four stanzas. Notice these are very short. They read very quick. In fact, it could be a stanza all to itself, but he broke it into four segments. So I'm going to read them all at once. And as you can guess, nothing's changed. He's stuck in that rut. He's going to keep 
belly aching for the whole poem. Okay, so he says, Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen the riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves, blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. The opening stanza on this page is actually sort of comical. He's picturing himself as being middle-aged, walking on the beach, rolled up trousers, walking along the beach. And in order to hide his bald spot, he's grown his hair long and parted the hair to cover it up. A comb over. He's even asked himself, do I dare to eat a peach? And I've heard numerous connections with this one. Uh, the, the more popular suggestion that critics like to point out is another Yonic symbol. And it's furthering the, the connection with the oyster previously mentioned at the opening. So all the imagery that was used in the opening stanza is now being used in the closing stanzas. Uh, Eliot's come full circle. While walking on the beach, he hears mermaids in the distance. They're singing. And as he points out, he they're not singing to him. They're singing to each other. This is not like the Little Mermaid. So that's the first thing you need to separate your logic from. It is not like the Little Mermaid. This is instead like the early British and Irish legends about mermaids where they are symbols of disaster um, they, they seek men in order to have sex with them and drown them destroy their lives um, they will seek out any and all men just to have the sex and drown them in this case they're they are like prostitutes so we again we've come full circle this, these mermaids are mythical prostitutes. <clears throat> this also brings us to the point, a point we need to acknowledge. Here, he's in a moment of fantasy. All the way up to this point, he's been using realistic images of the, the uh, downtown area and the realistic division of the classes. Here, he's finally got a moment where he's fantasizing. He's in the middle of a, a daydream, imagining these hybrid creatures, half fish, half woman, and they're singing out loud. But notice, they're not singing to Prufrock. He is so undesirable, a mermaid who would sleep with anybody, take anybody, any man, is refusing to sing the proof rock. He has failed in his own fantasy, where he's supposed to be the one in the most control. That's how pathetic he is. So after these three stanzas of regretting, realizing he can't even get the girl in his fantasy, okay, we get the closing stanza, and for the first time, really for the first time, the pronoun is shifted from the single I to the plural we. This opens up a lot of speculation. Who is Prufrock talking about here? Is it just me, myself, and I collectively one more time? Is it Prufrock and all humanity? Or is it Prufrock and the modern man? 
have men, all men, no matter their class, no matter their vocation, no matter their successes in life, have they all become dehumanized, um, belittled creatures um, that are not worthy of living. This last line is, is probably one of my most favorite lines in the whole poem. And the way I like to picture it, remember that hotel of uh, one night hotels. Uh, if he's in one of those hotels and he's having a bad time, he's probably getting drowsy and falling asleep. And he's having this fantasy as a dream while he's in the hotel. Okay. The prostitute leaves. He's lying there in a drowsy, half wake, half asleep. And then soon the manager comes up, the manager of the hotel comes up banging on the door, waking him up, basically saying, dude, your hour's up. You've been in here over five minutes over your time limit, time to go. And Prufrock has drowns in the reality of his life. Uh, ultimately accepting that he's worthless and there's nothing he can do about it because he won't try to do anything about it. Okay. This is the perfect modernist poem. It's not glorifying love. It's not exalting how wonderful humankind is. It's showing a very bitter bitter view of what the world has come down to. Uh, so when Eliot started this, the war had not begun yet. But by the time it was published, the war was only halfway over, really. Um, the war is echoing all the negativity that's being expressed in these lines. And this poem itself, like I said in the beginning, it, it firms up the theories and observations of what the modernists want to achieve in expressing through the culture. They're warning society, it's time to change. Do keep that in mind. This is not just a shock value verse. It, it does have a point. It's trying to warn society, it's time to change. Look at the situations around you, do something about it. So in a sense, the love song is a love song to all humans or all mankind. Uh, mankind the male aspect of humanity needs to shape up, needs to wake itself up make changes in its life, do something with themselves, change their morality. Okay. Um, so that's it for this week, week 15. I'll post this in a few seconds. If you end up with a lot of questions, just let me know. Um, this weekend, I'm going to try to be online. I've got some stuff to grade and you guys are going to be getting a major project soon. So take care, stay safe, and I'll talk with y'all later.